John Redmond, Power of Attorney, the show that aims to empower you through knowledge of the law. I'm Attorney John Redmond. And hello everyone, I'm Shauna Sanford. Did you know that there are more juvenile inmates with mental health issues in Louisiana than most other states? That's the finding of a report recently released by the State Juvenile Justice Implementation Commission. On today's show, we'll focus on the very serious topic of the juvenile justice system. It works differently than the system for adults, but it can be a complicated and scary thing for many families who have to go through it. Today we have an excellent guest, Attorney Tim Weber, who has worked through, uh, who has worked for more than two decades in the juvenile justice system. Tim has a lot of fascinating insights into how it works, and we will speak with him in just a few moments. Well, John, before we get to Tim, and he does have a lot of great information to share with us today, if you could, for our viewers out there, sort of help us understand the juvenile justice system for, well, juvenile justice system is much different than the system for adults. Absolutely, and uh, the big picture, and what viewers need to understand is, uh, when you're a, a child, mm -hmm. but old enough to get into trouble with the law, right. uh, you're not treated as an adult. In fact, a lot of times when you read about, um, God forbid, a murder, uh, if a child uh, 15 years old, 14 years old, 13 years old gets a, his hands on a gun, commits an armed robbery, kills somebody, the, the question is should we try him as an adult or try him as a child? Mm -hmm. Children who are treated as children under the law in the juvenile justice system um, uh, face a different set of laws and are sent to different prisons, tr are treated differently. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we have tried to do under Louisiana law is reform the juvenile justice system. In 2003, a lot of changes. We're going to talk about that. It's a fascinating discussion. It really and it needs is. more work, but it, we'll talk. Right, and it's had a big impact. Coming up next, attorney Tim Weber joins the show to talk about kids and crime and what you need to know about the juvenile justice system and how it's working. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Hello everyone and welcome back. Well, we've all either read the stories or seen them on the news. Kids committing crimes across the country, our state, and in our communities. And for some, it's a problem that hits too close to home. Is the juvenile justice system in Louisiana working? How does it work? Attorney Tim Weber is with us to answer those questions and many, many more. Tim currently works as a private attorney in family law, criminal defense, and other areas. He spent many years working with the Jefferson Parish Public Defender's Office where he represented juveniles accused of crimes. We're happy to have you here with us, Tim, my good friend. Why don't you describe for us what is juvenile justice and paint that picture for us. All What's right. going on with it? Um, Ten years ago, 2003, the Juvenile Justice Reform Act was passed. Uh, so the juvenile justice has changed drastically. Mm -hmm. If you look at the picture in 2003, uh, Tallulah Prison was still operating. One of the things that the Reform Act did was close down Tallulah. Tallulah was the worst prison, juvenile prison in the country. Uh, the Human Rights Watch released a report of human rights violations, international human rights violations occurring at Tallulah. Um, there was, children were being kept in solitary confinement. Children were being brutalized, children uh, were being sexually abused, and children were going hungry. Tallulah was a private prison, and the, the corporation that ran it to save money wasn't feeding the children enough. That's awful. At the time, in 2000, and you, the, the figures I have are from 2000, we had 1,800 juveniles in a juvenile penitentiary in Louisiana. The recidivism rate of those children over three years was 85 percent. Define recidivism. They commit another crime that landed them in, back in prison within a three-year period. After they had been released. After they'd so they had served their time, they were released, and, and then went, went back right and committed back in, another, another crime. Right back in, revolving door. Mm -hmm. yeah. Since then, what we're looking at, um, the snapshot today, uh, there are only 444 children in secure care of the three facilities still opened. Recidivism rate has dropped. You know, these are the worst of the worst children. Uh, recidivism rate over a three-year period. The last three-year period they, they have, can keep track of it was down to 45%. But, if you, but the figures over the past two years show that it's in falling. Each year it's getting less and less. So again, so in, in, when you track a child who's let out of prison, three years later, only 45 percent, although that's still kind of that's, shocking. That's still high. But that's not 85 percent. That's, that's not 85 percent. It shows the progress. Gotten into limit. trouble again and are, are going back into the juvenile right. justice system. And right. so when we look at the big picture of juvenile crime, 
it's safe to say that juvenile crime is actually going down here in Louisiana? Yes, juvenile crime rate is falling. Um, in Jefferson Parish, there were 8,000, over 8,000 crimes um, committed by juveniles in 2004. Mm -hmm. It's down to 3,000. That is a, a drastic fall off. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it shows that the progress we're making in Jefferson Parish things we are doing are working. And you directly attribute that to the Louisiana model. The Louisiana model, the reforms that we have put in, and the reforms that Jefferson Parish itself has put in on its Jefferson own. Specifically Jefferson Parish, yeah. Orleans Parish figures um, are constant, and, it, and they are, if anything, they are going down. There has been um, a reduction in the number of filings by the um, district attorney's office filing of new charges. There has been a reduction of the youths that, the youths, youths <laughs> that um, uh, petitions have been filed against over the, the past three years. Yeah. Let so, me see if I'm understanding you. You just described how there was a dramatic decrease in the number of crimes uh, involving youths from, uh, in Jefferson Parish from 2004. Uh, up until the present time, right. where you mentioned 2011. In Orleans Parish, has it, there been a similar decrease, or you're just saying there's a, a downward de or trend? There, there's a downward trend. I cannot pull up uh, Orleans Parish's uh, uniform crime statistic figures like I can in Jefferson. They're okay. a little harder to find. I had to pull through uh, the public defender's records okay. and the Louisiana Supreme Court records. Okay. I have to thank Josh Perry for helping me with that. Okay. Well, thank you, Josh Perry. Uh, you mentioned secured care, and I just want our viewers to be very clear about what you mean when you say secured care. When we're talking about the juvenile justice system, we don't refer to jail for juveniles, right? right? You're calling it secured care. Secured care is when you are locked into a prison facility and you cannot leave. Okay. Um, it is the, the equivalent of an adult prison. It is, but the, the language changes, right? The language changes. In juvenile, all the language changes. All the language changes. Now, I think it's also important to point out, you, you look at this dramatic drop in the number of juvenile crimes. Katrina happened in 2005, yes. and some might say, well, that had to have been a big factor. But you said specifically in Jefferson Parish, if you look at the numbers, you're looking at a population uh, that did not disperse, that was not, uh, that, that actually stayed in place. So you can directly attribute the decrease in the numbers of juvenile crimes to the reform that has taken yes. place. Yes, yes. Uh, Jefferson Parish, the population didn't change. It did not flood. Uh, Orleans Parish, you, you can't make that same argument, but Jefferson Parish didn't flood. We have the same population. And even post-Katrina, if you look at the numbers uh, post-Katrina, mm -hmm. uh, after the initial lull when all the children came back, it's been falling since then, still. It's not one big drop. There was a big drop, but then there was a steady decline and since then. And one of the reasons, the, the reasons why this is happening is the number one indicator of uh, future criminal behavior with a juvenile is how long they st stay in detention. Mm -hmm. If you put a child in jail, as much as all of our good intentions of the good reasons why we're doing it, what happens is they make new friends with the bad kids. Right. You as a parent would never do this. If your child got in trouble with another child, you wouldn't say, oh, we're gonna, y'all, you're gonna stay with little Johnny. You know, you broke into a car with them, y'all are going to hang out together now to figure out how to do it right. right. The state shouldn't do it either. Right. So in Jefferson Parish, we have an alternative to detention program. What will happen is if a child comes in and, and is arrested by the sheriff's deputy, they will go into an assessment center. They will uh, be interviewed. A risk assessment will be made. It will be made on objective factors, not subjective factors, because we are very worried about um, minorities being treated differently and going to prison as opposed to a white boy just because uh, they're a different race. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, objective standards are used and, this, and the um, court tries to use um, home incarceration, supervision by probation officers for anyone that's not a public safety risk. What are some of those objective factors? Just to The give crime us the child is accused of committing um, and his criminal record. Okay. Those are the big two things that we use. 
So help us understand, when we talk about the juvenile justice system, and we mentioned earlier in the intro that it can be confusing, that it can be scary for families that have to navigate this system. What happens from the very beginning? If a child does commit a crime, well, what happens? Accused of committing, or accused. accused of committing a crime. Yes. They will go to the, they will be interviewed by the sheriff's office. All right. If you are a parent, do not let your child give a statement without talking to a lawyer. The biggest problem that we have in juvenile law is adolescent development. Children will tell an adult what the adult wants to hear to try to get out of trouble. Mm -hmm. We have a big problem in juvenile law with false confessions. The big example is the New York uh, Central Park jogger case which occurred in the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, four young, um, I believe they were African Americans, um, uh, a jogger in New York, Central Park, was beaten so badly that she had no memory of what happened and raped. Her, she was found, uh, I believe she's doing all right today, but mm -hmm. she had no memory of what happened. Mm -hmm. Four youths were arrested in the park. They gave inculpatory statements, which they say were coerced. Um, Donald Trump put four in four New York newspapers, full page ads calling for the return of the death penalty for juveniles. These boys were convicted, they sat in prison, and were exonerated with the new DNA technology. Which that they did not, they did not do, it. do it. And these boys didn't, uh, nobody stepped forward, and, or they didn't know to say, well, I should have a lawyer. They're, they didn't have parents, didn't maybe, have to say, don't talk to my child. And because there was no parent or lawyer to stop the children from being interrogated, or they basically, gave inculpatory, which is a fancy way of saying statements that made them appear to say they were guilty, Correct. right? Correct. And, and, and so the moral of the story is if a work. child is arrested, the child uh, should be given the opportunity of having a lawyer uh, to, to not make them give statements. Correct. And of course, on the other side of the token is, well, hold on, you're going to make law enforcement's job a whole lot harder. Uh, at, at, at getting the guilty kids uh, convicted. And, and what do you say to those critics? Well, I say that juvenile confessions are worthless. Uh, there are some countries, in, in, under their law, confessions are not allowed because of fear of coercion. If the police department do their job, they will have the evidence they need to convict. They should not rely on a 13-year-old on be, being put under pressure to without having an adult wanted. or a representative with the child at least protecting the Often rights. they will have an adult. Often they will have an adult mm -hmm. under juvenile law. The preference is to have an adult there. It used to be mandatory. Now it's under the totality of the circumstance, which I don't think we need to get into. But is there an age limit? An age limit. Uh, age of 10 t can be charged with a crime and sent to prison. Uh, at the age of 17, adult um, jurisdiction kicks in. Uh, age of 15, if this crime is serious, murder, rape, armed robbery, the child can be transferred. But if you're younger, if the child is younger than 10, let's say it's a nine-year-old or an eight-year-old that's accused of committing some sort of crime, um, could well, that child be arrested? The child is not going to be arrested. Um, at that point, the child is a family in need of services. It is, the child is uh, under the old law as a child in need of supervision. But what will happen is they will be reported to the juvenile court. They might have to meet with a, the probation department. Services might be put into place. Uh, mental health issues might be addressed. Therapy might be addressed. Parental supervision might be addressed. I'm going to have to ask you to hold it right, <laughs> right there because we have to take a break. Stay tuned. Coming up next, we're going to answer your questions, and we have lots of them. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Time now to get to your questions about the juvenile justice system. Our guest is attorney Tim Weber, and we want to thank you so much for contacting us through Facebook and Twitter. We have some really great, great questions, and so we're going to get straight to them. I mentioned earlier about a report that was recently released, uh, which um, looked at the mental health status of youngsters who are in the juvenile system. And our first question comes from Jennifer. She says, why is there a lack of mental care for children? And that report found that there are 
are more children with mental health issues in the Louisiana juvenile justice system than in any other state. Are you surprised by that? I've seen it. it it's appalling. Uh, the problem we have is uh, people are using the juvenile justice system instead of the mental health system. Um, it's there's no logical reason for it. It's budget cuts. Mm. Um, the Office of um, uh, Children who should be receiving mental health treatment are ending up being arrested for whatever mental health problem they have, mm -hmm. and you're ending up criminalizing being mentally ill. Mm -hmm. This has been going on for years. It needs to be addressed. It needs to be addressed by more services in the community as opposed to putting them in prison and thinking a prison is going to solve someone's mental Sounds health like problem. Almost like a human rights issue. It's like it this, is is a human this is a child who's got obviously got. Uh, health issues, it happens to be mental health versus physical health, and uh, can't uh, restrain uh, his or her behavior, and instead of recognizing that, they, they're just treating him like a, a kid who steals a car or right. does something else that they should be able to, um, now, they should, should treat it differently. In the defense of the Office of Juvenile Justice, they are, they do have mental health treatment in the facilities. They do. If you are, if you get locked up in a state facility, um, there are mental health units that they uh, can treat uh, the children. The sad thing is that the children shouldn't be there in the first place. In the first place, yeah. They, they should be have been diverted out and and had. Uh, mental health services instead of being incarcerated. Right. Uh, earlier I mentioned uh, the Louisiana model. We um, yes. didn't really explain that, but when you talk about reform, here it's called the Louisiana model, but it's patterned after the Missouri model. That's is that correct? Correct. correct. Yeah. It is a, um, a more therapeutic model than a lock them up and throw away the key model. Mm -hmm. um, the idea is to have a child in a, um, as close to a home-like environment as possible instead of as close to a prison environment, an institutional environment. Mm -hmm. yeah, the we reason is if you lock them up, you might as well throw away the key, because when you, well when you put key. a child in with other criminals, the child is basically learning how to become a criminal, he, as opposed to learning how to uh, address the issues that got the child into the uh, criminal trouble in the first place. Right. right. Back prior to the 2003 reforms, uh, the system was called the Louisiana Training Institute. The only thing that I, from my experience, thought that they, they were, these children were trained to do was to steal Dodge automobiles. <laughs> mm, wow. <laughs> That's yeah. awful. But it makes sense. If you are a parent, you know, and if you were, ever were a teenager, which I was, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. At that age, your friends, your peer group are the most important thing to you. You're trying to learn how to work your way through the world, and the people that you associate with become who you are. Right. Yeah. You know, you assume their identity. Right. Uh, we have another question here. It says, what will happen to my son's juvenile crim criminal record once he becomes an adult? Will his record affect his ability to find a job? It shouldn't. Juvenile records are confidential. Um, also, they are not adult convictions. Um, so if you're ever asked on a job application, have I ever been convicted of a crime? If you are juvenile and you are adjudicated, in juvenile court, not adult court, you can say no. Um, you don't even you don't have the same rights in juvenile court as you do in adult court. You do not have the right to a jury trial. Mm -hmm. um, so if it is not a conviction for adult purposes, you don't have to worry about uh, the habitual offender statute. They cannot charge take a juvenile crime and treat it as an adult crime. Uh, for those, the, the habitual offender statute is that three strikes, you're out. Okay. All right. It's not your first strike. Okay. You start over once you turn 17 years old and do you go through the adult so system. So you get a clean slate. If Provided you don't do anything uh, that would send you to adult prison, right. you essentially get a clean slate, it sounds exactly. like. That's exactly. what you're saying. Exactly. Now, um, there's a limit to that. If you are applying for a top secret uh, security clearance, this is going to come up. All right. Okay. Um, there are limits to that, but your basic, uh, and also if it's a sex crime, because you will have to register if it's a sex crime. Okay. Uh, but your basic run-of-the-mill property crime, um, 
you don't have to worry about that. And Tim, you want a graphic that we want to pull up and show um, as we're talking about the juvenile crime rate here uh, going down. School arrests have actually declined. That's right. And we're going to pull that graphic up so that you can see it. And we're going to, this takes us from 2008 uh, to 2011. Talk a little bit about the numbers and what we're seeing there. What we're seeing is the effort, um, one of the concerns in, in juvenile court is we call it the school to prison pipeline. The school's trying to use um, the probation department and the juvenile court system as their discipline. Mm -hmm. All right. So if a child has a fight in school, instead of the school disciplining them, they call the sheriff's office and there's an arrest and the child has a record. Mm -hmm. um, we're trying to avoid that. We're trying to work with the schools, and you see this is a graphic from the Children Youth Planning Board in Jefferson. Right. What the Children Youth Planning Board is, all of the actors get together. We have monthly meetings, the DAs, the sheriff's office, the judges, the public defenders, the mental health providers. We meet, we discuss, we yell at each other, and we try to come up with a plan to reduce <laughs> juvenile crime in Jefferson. Uh -huh. um, and it's been working. You know, this is something that we have that is very cooperative that you do not see in the adult system. You don't see the judges and the DAs and the public defenders and the jailers and the security and mental health providers in the adult system sitting around mm -hmm. a table yelling at each other mm -hmm. and work, trying to work things out. One of the things that they're finding in Missouri is that because of what they've implemented in the juvenile justice system, that it's having a direct impact on the adult system. Are we starting to see any of that here in Louisiana because of what we have in place? I don't have those statistics and I would suspect that we're not seeing it yet, but we will see it soon because all of these children that we are, that are coming out of the system now are not going to be committing new crimes. They're learning how to be productive citizens, and you're going to see a drop in the crime rate. I would hope over the years, if this model maintains and still does what it's been doing now, we still see the progress, that we start seeing the adult system, especially for younger adults, 17-year-olds, start adopting this system. Mm -hmm. And I can see the exponential effect of that. They're not only not committing crimes, they're contributing to the economy because Correct. they're holding down jobs, they're paying taxes, uh, they're hopefully raising families and, and raising showing families. how that they, they, they got on the right path, off the wrong path. Right. So it sounds very positive. Um, go ahead. And it's going to increase because one of the things you're seeing is, you know, I talked about the number one indicator that mm -hmm. is length of time in detention. Right. The number two indicator is if you have a family member in prison. If your father or your mother is in prison, you're much more likely to go to prison. Go to prison. Just like if your father or your mother is a lawyer, you're much more likely to become a lawyer. Mm -hmm. What you'll see is these children do not go to prison, their children will not go to prison. It's, it's, it's just a prison. snowballing effect Correct. in a positive way. One thing I just want to mention real quick, um, in the juvenile justice system, kids that commit crimes that harm somebody else, you know, you start a fire, you steal somebody's car and you wreck it, you can subject your family members to civil liability. If little Johnny gets into a fight at school and he pushes a kid down the stairs, um, you know, if, if that child has uh, parents and the parents have a homeowner's insurance policy, you can be sued for that too. Right. Just a little cautionary note for, for uh, right. people to also keep in mind. There's other ramifications besides facing criminal justice uh, in the juvenile justice system. It doesn't just affect the child. It right. could have a direct impact on it the will. family. Yeah. Uh, and the, the family might be ordered to pay restitution. Uh, or normally, I, I take that back, normally children will not pay restitution because they, um, they're children. They're children. Mm -hmm. Okay. But there will be this liability Parents and there will be... for the acts of their children. Yes. And there will be... Generally speaking, and if they have insurance policies like a homeowner's policy, right. that can be held accountable in certain occasions. Yeah. But th there will be some restitution. Right. Um, the court is not going to expect a child to be able to pay $100,000 in the restitution. Sure. But we'll expect some restitution to the right. victim. Is there an average length of stay in a juvenile detention facility? That's another question from a viewer. A, a juvenile detention facility. A juvenile court is different than adult court in our time frame. We are fast. Mm -hmm. A juvenile, um, once he's arrested, has to be brought in within 72 hours to the continued custody hearing. Adult, it's the same thing for the... the uh, for the bond hearing. At this point it changes. District Attorney's Office has 48 hours to file a petition to accept or refuse charges on that juvenile held in detention. An adult court, uh, 60 days. Juvenile court, after that 48 hours, they must be brought in for answer, which is the equivalent of adult arraignment within 15 days. Adult court, 
30 days. At that point, it's set for trial. Juvenile court, if it's a crime and it's a property crime, it will be set for trial in 30 days. If it's a crime of violence, it has to be set within 60 days. Okay. Adult court, 120 days. The gist of it is, if you are a juvenile and you are arrested and it's not a crime of violence, you will be tried before the district attorney's office in an adult case has to even decide whether to accept charges or not. So it does move very fast. It moves fast. It does, yeah. Because the court is aware, and everyone is aware, the longer they're there, the worst they're going to be. Well, I wish we had yeah. more time, Tim. We have certainly enjoyed it, learned a lot. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I hope that you'll come back with us. I would love to. <laughs> right. Anytime. That is all the time that we have for this show. Please join us next week when we will delve into another important legal topic and some of the information that you need to know to protect your rights. You can sign up for that mailing list online at johnredmondpoa.com or jrpoa.com where you can also watch every episode of this show and get information about everything discussed on the show. Remember to follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and send in your questions and comments by email. We'll see you next week on Power of Attorney. Welcome to this Lanyap edition of Power of Attorney with our guest, Tim Weber, who does uh, criminal defense work, um, juvenile defense work, and family law in private practice, formerly with many years of experience working as a public defender doing juvenile law and related types of law. Uh, Tim, thank you for doing this Lanyap section. Um, we're going to continue the discussion that we did on our TV show. Um, uh, I want to ask you the more broad question. Uh, does a, a juvenile, a child who is uh, accused of a crime, uh, uh, looks like he's been arrested or looks like maybe he's going to be arrested, does he need a lawyer? And if he needs a lawyer, she need a lawyer? And if so, when do you get a lawyer? Let's say you're the parent or the guardian. Absolutely needs a lawyer. Okay. Um, absolutely. In when fact, the law and, requires it. Okay. Oh, the law requires it. Yes. And if they need a lawyer, when do they need a lawyer? At what point do they get a lawyer? And uh, frankly, how does someone afford a lawyer? I know lawyers often charge a lot of money. If they, if they can't afford a lawyer, they can use a public defender's office. Uh, the public defender's office in Orleans, Jefferson Parish, uh, all the lawyers are very competent. Um, competent meaning they can do their job. They can do their job. They can do their job. Okay. Uh, there, there's good supervision in both of those parishes. Now, what lawyer you get, it changes from day to day, so I cannot tell you. Um, if you don't feel comfortable with that lawyer, hire a private attorney. Okay. Find the money. Right. It's important for right. your child. Why, why would you hire a private uh, attorney if you got competent lawyers in the public defender's office? Well, if you're comf comf confident, comfortable with your lawyer, then it's not necessary. If you're not, or if it's a, a serious case and you are concerned about the experience that particular lawyer has, hire a private a private lawyer. Okay. And um, so, uh, what are the? Let's talk about that. Pros and cons of a public defender versus uh, a private uh, practice attorney. A private practice attorney is somebody who maybe they've been doing it a long time. Maybe they've been out of law school for a year or two. I guess depending on the private practice attorney, uh, that that's one of that could tell you if it's a pro or a con right there. Why don't you explain? Well, you need first you need a lawyer with criminal experience because what we're dealing with are criminal statutes, mm -hmm. right? You also uh, need a lawyer who understands juvenile law and has juvenile law experience because there are differences because we are talking about adolescent development of children. Um, there has been a push in some areas of the country to have a special certification for juvenile lawyers. Uh, we do not do not have that in Louisiana. So if you're looking for a lawyer, you want to use the internet, you want to use whatever uh, referrals you have to get a lawyer who's not just has criminal experience, but also has juvenile experience. Right. So if I'm understanding you, uh, let's go back to that first question. Does a child need a lawyer uh, uh, if charged with a juvenile offense? Uh, and when, uh, the answer is yes, a child definitely needs a lawyer if charged with a crime. In fact, they're required to have one. And when, when is from the get-go right away? When it will be when they're brought to court for their continued custody hearing, a, a lawyer will be appointed for them. Okay. okay. Uh, if you, you should hire a lawyer before you let your child give any statement to the police. It should be, a, do not give a statement 
and then hope that they're just going to let it go away. That's not their job. Their job is if they take a statement, if there's evidence, your child will be arrested. Is, typically, uh, is, are the police going to be trying to interview the child before yes. that first court hearing? Yes, okay. they will. So even if you don't have a lawyer for your child, can you insist that the child uh, not uh, be interviewed or yes. insist that the child have a lawyer yes. uh, uh, and let the lawyer decide about an interview before the interview happens? Yes, a child has all the constitutional rights as an adult with the exception of a jury trial. So you can insist on your Sixth Amendment right to counsel. Uh, at any stage of the proceedings, and, and you should. In virtually no lawyer is going to allow that child to be interviewed. No lawyer is going to uh, allow that child to be interviewed. The big problem we have, one of the big problems we have, is adult standards being imposed on children. These, the criminal defense, the criminal statutes are written for an adult. The, the most egregious example I'll give you is the aggravated rape statute. Mm -hmm. Aggravated rape which carries as an adult a life sentence is having sex with a ch in, uh, amongst the many things mm -hmm. is having a child under the age of 13 mm -hmm. having sex with a child under the age of 13 what if your child's 12 and he has sex with an 11 year old child this has happened okay. I mean I've had this case mm -hmm. they're both under the age of 13 what's the district attorney's office going to do charge them both with aggravated rape right that's crazy. It's crazy. This is a crazy case. This is a statute written for adults. Right. Well, what about what if you're a parent and you say, "Look, you know what? Maybe my kid. This is all a big mistake. Well, let me just go in there. I, I didn't go to law school, but you know, it's all a big. My child tells me uh, he didn't do nothing uh, wrong. I'm not a lawyer, but I can go in there and I can I can speak for my child, and we can sort this all out. Is that wise? No. Why not? Your child is going to lie to you because they don't want to get in trouble. All right? I didn't they get are the cookie out of the cookie jar. It's just a little bit more advanced. It's a little more advanced. That wasn't me. They're not <laughs> going to tell you the truth. But then you have a deputy who is confronting him with years of experience interviewing children. They're going to tell that deputy an entirely different story than they told you, and they're going to land up yeah. In detention. In fact, getting back to a, an example you gave on the television show, also available on this uh, website, um, some deputies, if they have convicted themselves in their own mind that the child is guilty, they have ways of interrogation uh, that uh, might get the child to admit to doing a wrong the child never did, correct? This is a common problem we have in juvenile court, false confessions of juveniles. I gave the example of a cent the Central Park jogger. There's a similar case. A in lady Chicago. in New York who was beaten so badly she didn't remember what happened. Donald Trump took out ads saying, uh, return the death penalty for juveniles. Later on, after the children were convicted, after they confessed, DNA exculpated right. them entirely. So they exactly. didn't do it at all. The similar children were, had their Chicago. words, they, they had their heads turned around in right. interviews and they said they did it or they said words that people interpreted as saying right. they did it. Right. All right, we're running but, short on time, but, but go ahead. What were you trying to say? I think I interrupted you. Um, you had a similar case in Chicago, five juveniles arrested for rape and murder. False, the, the children were saying these were, you know, they, they were coerced out of me. Again, DNA comes back. Yeah. Once they torn. had attorneys get involved later on, right. the attorneys tried to sort out the mess, but by then right. a lot of the damage, damage has been done. done. The other thing, and I'm not, I'm, you know, and I'm, this is why I'm really insistent, what you think as a parent, this is not serious, as soon as the adult statutes start applying adult circumstances, it becomes serious. It's adult statutes applied in juvenile in court, juvenile applied court. to juveniles, even though there it's, it's juvenile uh, penalties, et cetera. A kid with a, a BB gun takes another boy's bicycle. All right, that's bad. I'm not saying it's it's a good thing. All but right, I probably did that when I was a kid. But it's no, I didn't do that. But, but it's not but armed robbery. Still, it's not and taking it, a gun that could kill somebody. But it it is treated as an armed robbery because as an adult it would be treated as an armed robbery, and your child is looking yeah. at a mandatory prison sentence. Right. And maybe the DA is using that just for leverage, so they can get you to admit to uh, to to agree to a plea deal later on. That's whatever they feel like getting. They get a conviction on their uh, uh, um, on their whatever their uh, conviction. Rates. Right. right. Uh, la last thing, because um, again, we're, we're, these uh, webinars run short. These web uh, web interviews run short. Um, overall, if you can afford an experienced uh, uh, private attorney with many years' experience working in this field, 
uh, that may have a definite advantage. If you meet, if you interview several uh, private attorneys uh, and you feel very comfortable, uh, that's, that's a more solid uh, advantage at, at um, having your name cleared, your child's name cleared, than going with the public defender's office where you might get a less experienced person, whoever's assigned. Um, is that a fair statement? That's a fair statement. Okay. If you were in that circumstance, would you want a lawyer with 20 years experience or someone fresh out of law school? Right. trying to gain experience on your right. with, at your child's expense. Now, last, uh, last part, and I'll see if you can answer this in about 60 seconds. What's the best way for somebody to go looking for a private attorney uh, in the greater New Orleans area? How do you, how do you go looking you, you for somebody? You need to like do some footwork because it's not as easy. There's only a few of us. Get on the, get on the uh, internet, uh, talk to people. Um, you need to do some footwork, but find someone with experience. Okay. Um, Tim Weber, uh, very grateful to you for your time and your very interesting insights into the juvenile justice system. Great strides made, a lot more work to be done. Thank you for being here. Um, thank you for watching us. Thank you for joining us on this um, interview, and we look forward to seeing you on John Redmond, Power of Attorney, on other webcasts and other show productions. Thank you.